everyone, I'm uh, Edgar, a uh, rocketeer. Today I interview the Lunar Zebra team from TU Delft in the Netherlands. Please introduce yourself with your name and what you do in your team. I'm Jason James. I'm a third year uh, aerospace uh, bachelor student. Uh, at the moment, I'm the head of systems engineering. I've uh, been in the team for about three years. And uh, yeah, so I really focus on the high level mission planning and uh, seeing how different systems are integrated with each other. Hi, I'm Floss. I am an electronics engineer of the Lunar Zebra team. I joined uh, 2.5 years ago, and I first worked on uh, a year on the terrestrial rover, and now I'm kind of doing both. Um, so yeah, and I'm doing now currently my bachelor's in electrical engineering. And then from my side, I'm I'm um, yeah, Marnix. Uh, I'm the head of media team at Luna Zebra, so I'm trying to promote Luna Zebra as much as possible and try to participate in events and interviews like these. Uh, I am. It's now my second academic year that I'm at the. Uh, yeah, and I'm an aerospace student, so also fascinated by everything space. How can someone start a rocketry in a space team? It's a very good question, a very complicated, well, not quite complicated question, because it's a matter of someone really wanting to do it. And once you really want to do it, then you can start talking with different professors. The cool thing about a university is that you have professors who tend to uh, encourage students to, 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 to do things. Uh, for instance, I think there's now someone trying to set up a new team for space habitat uh, stuff. So like um, a habitat on the moon. And then what she's doing is she's sending, she's putting flyers everywhere in, in, in all the faculties uh, in the hopes that she gets some like-minded people answering her. And, and then she can start a, a whole new team. But I know for, for Luna Zebra, for example, how it happened is that there was a professor from the University of Pennsylvania who worked already on uh, rovers with the C-shaped legs like us who came, um, and then this professor came to the TU Delft, and here he basically wanted to continue his research on that subject, and he got a few students involved, and then it became a team of students, and then eventually the students kind of took over, and under ob obviously the supervision of, 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 of a few professors, the students came up with a plan of how to make this terrestrial rover uh, become a moon rover, basically. Uh, and that's how slowly, slowly it started to grow into a bigger, bigger thing. But it's really the first step is you wanting to do it. And then if you start talking with people and you try to get a little group of people doing things, eventually you, you get to grow um, your team. And then once you grow your team, then it's a matter of recruiting dedicated people to dedicated tasks. And then you really are going. And that's what happened with us. It's happened also with other teams. I think you interviewed uh, there, the dream team, the Delft Aerospace Rocketry dream team. I suppose it, it happened also a bit in a similar way that uh, just a few people decided to do this and then eventually it grew into something big. So it's all about willing and then you can do it. How is this studying in the Netherlands? Um, do you study all in English? This depends um, per faculty. Uh, so I think the university is slowly transitioning for many faculties to be more international. I know the aerospace faculty is entirely international. I think the uh, software faculty at the minimum has an option between the uh, between Dutch and, and, and um, English. Uh, some other faculties are still a bit uh, mostly Dutch. It depends really per faculty. Uh, from aerospace, it's all in English. So yeah, you would have to look a little bit at the, at the website and see in which language it is taught. But then once you're into it and once you're doing the, the, the courses and all these things, you adapt quite quickly to do it all in English if you're from outside of, if you're not an English speaking person. It's a matter of getting used to it. And uh, for example, on the mathematical side, you might have to get used to the terminology a little bit, but that's something you really learn. So that's not a blocking point. And it's nice to, for it to be in English because you meet a lot of international people from all over the, the world, not only Europe, but uh, everywhere else. What are the job opportunities in your university? Many. Well, the TU Delft is very well known um, everywhere, especially in aerospace, but also, for example, in, in something completely different in architecture, it's also very well known. And in all the other faculties, software, industrial design, electronics, all of these are also quite good. So, so usually people sometimes, students sometimes get hired or get a job uh, proposed to them even before they completely finish their studies. So, so it's, it's quite a good university to be at. But in terms of exactly which um, jobs we can get, if you're in the aerospace industry, or if you work, for example, at Lunar Zebra in uh, part-time, then you, you're likely to get into any aerospace company, be it one of the new startups, which are getting bigger and bigger nowadays. There are many more startups coming up, or the typical things like ESA or NASA, but NASA and, and SpaceX and the likes, it's a bit more difficult for non-American people because there are a few legal issues. 
uh, but still, you can still get into there to some degree. So, so it, it, it really depends. And then in, in terms of how to get those jobs, you, you always get opportunities like, um, uh, I don't remember how they call it, but the big networking event for, the, for, for where companies come to the TU Delft and you can network with them and try to see what company suits you best. So you have, the TU Delft really provides a lot of opportunities there. How did you prepare for university? From my school system, you have different choices to take towards the end of your school system. And I was more in the mathematical and science uh, part of it. So that made the entry into the aerospace sector or any kind of engineering se uh, se sector much easier. But then in terms of, uh, there are some entry exams, but then it's just a matter of, of looking at your courses. And normally, if you were qu quite fine at school, if you weren't doing too bad, then, then it wasn't that difficult. Although it's quite competitive, it wasn't super, super difficult to get into uh, the university. But it's all a matter of just a little bit preparing a little bit in advance and, and yeah, looking through the different universities and then making sure that you revise whatever you need to revise. What are your goals? Lunar Zebra is, is a student team um, at the TU Delft. And in the first place, there, the main objective is to uh, send uh, a rover to the moon to... Uh, we would then be also the first European uh, moon rover uh, launched. So the main goal is to send the rover to the moon. And um, that will happen in a couple of years. You will just have to follow our social media. But it's all about technology demonstration in the first mission. We want to prove that our very strange uh, design, which are the C-shaped legs, that those actually work uh, on the moon as we expect them to work. And it's important for us to do this test, to do this technology demonstration, because from then we expect um, if it works then probably people will get interested in what we do get a bit of a snowball effect where we can do more exciting things i think we will talk about future projects uh but then later on because our rover is very small and very light it's basically the size of an a4 sheet and not much higher than your index finger i always like to say so very tiny and the fact that it's so tiny and so uh, lightweight uh, that means that we can put more than just one on our uh, on the lander which with which we go so we can send maybe 10 or 20 at once and then they start to swarm like little insects uh you know those ants and all those things you see them walking in a bit of an organized way uh, but still they are each independent tiny uh, ants we will be we hope to do the same later on to swarm uh, on the surface of the moon because then you can do much more exciting and more dangerous stuff uh, than with a big rover because uh, big rovers are uh, how should I compare this? Not not quite a car size, but but let's say half of a car, and they weigh also very uh, a lot. So it's it's and it's super expensive to launch them. So you would not dare to put one of those uh, big rovers in a crater or in a cave in in the moon, because if if for some reason it gets upside down or it breaks, then your whole mission is over. So it's just a single point of failure, and it's quite dangerous. Uh, so what we can do is send a swarm over there. They all swarm into the cave. And if one of them falls down, it's not too bad because you have still, if you send 20, for example, you have still 19 left to continue the mission. So it, uh, that's the main objective that we want to do with swarming. And then uh, if that, if we get to do that, then we can think of missions like finding water, for example, or going into a cave and, and trying to see how the cave looks like uh, before astronauts would go into there. And we also have exciting things. Um, I think we will touch we touch upon them a bit later. But uh, an exciting idea is the Lufar mission, which is sending a swarm to the backside of the moon and then listening into the early universe. So it's all different exciting ideas, but they all start with uh, the first technology demonstration mission uh, that will happen soon. How can someone join your team? That's a good question, and the question we that's also a question we get very often. So the main thing is you have to be a student, preferably. We can do some exceptions, but in general, you have to be a student, uh, preferably in the Netherlands at the TU Delft, or for example, there is another university next to the TU Delft called In Holland University, from which we also have students, even from other universities around us. So as long as you're a student and you're willing to 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 do besides your studies some um, uh, some extra things in a moon mission, which is super unique for students then you can join. And especially if you have technical skills and you can just apply for one of the technical positions we have open. But if you're rather into uh, soft skills and, and, and communicating with people, then you can apply for, for example, the media team, which is me, or for the partnership uh, team, which is also super important because they're looking for uh, partners and sponsors, let's say, to get us to the moon, basically. Um, so yeah, it's really whatever your background is, if you're motivated and if you're a student having and you have time to do something exciting like 
launching a rover to the moon, then you can join us. Can someone join to um, online review? That's a bit of a tricky question. We like to keep our, uh, if you mean design reviews and such, we like to keep them probably internal, uh, mainly because uh, we want to discuss that with our partners and uh, with people from the industry who we trust. Um, so they can, they will join, but for external parties to join, that's relatively unlikely. But however, what people can join online and not online is bigger uh, events like a webinar. We did a webinar, I think, two summers ago, which you can watch. Uh, but there will probably be one again at some point in the near future, uh, be it a webinar or an actual event live at the campus or somewhere else. That's something you can join. And in that, we would also show our design, for example, and, and show the different aspects of it. So that's very fascinating to look at. Um, but the actual internal design reviews remain most of the time internal, um, and we don't invite uh, any people from outside of it. How do you manage your team? That's a good question, because um, a space mission is obviously not something uh, that you see every day uh, around. So, so it's very important to make sure that it goes as expected and that we have a good plan uh, for how to get there. So the big Lunar Zero team is divided in different departments. Uh, the technical departments like software, electronics, um, uh, structures. We also have assembly, integration, and testing, which is a department. You can think of all these different departments, which then, so so those are little groups, let's say, within our Luna Zebra team. And there, each of these little groups have their own head of department. Um, but on top of all the heads of departments, you have a chief engineer who has a supervision of everything and who has a big overview of everything. Uh, and then these head of departments meet the chief engineer every so often to discuss all the changes that have to be done or, or the improvements that have been done or some new ideas that came up. And then the, the chief engineer will, with his overarching view, will then decide if that's a good idea or, or that's a bad idea. So that's for the technical side. On the non-technical side, you have partnerships and media. Uh, each of these teams also have a head of department. For media, it happens to be me. And then we manage our team also separately, but we do also meet with the different technical uh, departments because we need to get up to date on what's happening. Uh, so yeah, it's it's constantly, it's all about uh, having smaller teams, which then have a head and all the heads then meeting every so often and then discussing things and that all flowing back to the teams. Uh, so that's the rough uh, picture. But then on top of all these little groups, you also have a bigger management, let's say, who's also, for example, doing the link with the TU Delft or with other people. Uh, who is a bit higher up and who can also um, yeah, more network with, with higher level people. But um, yeah, that's roughly the, the system we use. So it, it, it's all about dividing and then having a good plan of attack for everything. How's the experimental rocketry community in your con? In the Netherlands, uh, there is DARE, the Delft Aerospace Rocket, um, Rocketry, Rocket Engineers Society, which you interviewed, I believe, on your YouTube channel. So they're uh, quite advanced in what they do. They try to get to, to uh, just outside of the atmosphere as soon as possible to be the first team to do that. But there, I think, are also a few other smaller teams doing this, uh, trying to do that all over the Netherlands. So, so there is quite a bit of a community and it's a fun, um, let's say, competition between each of them on who does the best rocket and who launches the, 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 the nicest one. But, uh, but we are not exactly in the rocketry side. We are more in the space uh, side. And in the space side, especially, I can speak especially from the TU Delft, uh, there's us, Luna Zero, sending something to the moon. There might be a future uh, team trying to do moon habitats or, or space habitats, let's say. But there's also a team from our faculty uh, launching a CubeSat. So CubeSat is a tiny satellite the size of a pack of milk, people say always in the Netherlands, but uh, it's basically something like 20 centimeters tall and then 10 centimeters wide. Uh, they're designing a CubeSat for high school students. So that's um, that's a bit of a space thing. There's also another space team, Team Tumbleweed, which is a bit of an international team, but it has also quite a big uh, team here in the Netherlands. And they're designing a bit strange, let's say, balls um, or spheres, which then can roll, for example, on Mars with the winds. And while they roll, they map, for example, the winds, but they can also look at the terrain while they roll. So there are many different uh, initiatives doing all kinds of different uh, things. So it's really a vibrant uh, community coming up more and more. And then besides all of those um, amateur things or, or student things, there's also all the startups that are coming up. And in the Netherlands, there are a few 
like uh, Isis Space is a, is a well-known one. They they came up came out of uh, the TU Delft uh, when the TU Delft launched their own CubeSat, their own small satellite. Uh, Isis Space eventually became a company. Uh, but there are other also other smaller um, companies. Some of them we work with. So it's really a big uh, space community in the Netherlands, but in Europe in general, it's it's quite booming at the moment. How do you promote your team? Yeah, that's a good question, especially for me, I suppose. It's really by doing things like this, like the like the interview, and then I'm I'm hoping that people will watch it on YouTube and then maybe be intrigued by this by this cool project that we're doing. Uh, but it's also about going to events. Uh, as it happens now, at the time of recording, in a few days' time, there will be a bit of, a, of, of an event here at the TU Delft where we will have our own stand, uh, where we will be showing off what we do. We'll also go to some kind of uh, science festival uh, where we try to show what we are doing. It's all about creating awareness, and especially in the Netherlands, making the Dutch people aware that there is a Dutch mission going to the moon, because that's what excites people. The fact that it comes from your own country and your own people sending something to the moon, it's quite uncommon. Uh, so we try to do all of that. But obviously, people can follow us on our social media. So that's for now, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, our YouTube channel as well, uh, LinkedIn, for people wanting to follow us on LinkedIn. But also, we, we are uh, setting up a podcast where we already have a few episodes. So the Lunar Zebra podcast, which you can simply follow, uh, listen to, and you get all the background story and the bigger picture from that. So we try to do all those different things to try to promote it as much as possible. Um, yeah, and, and thanks for getting us also in this interview because that's a nice way for us to show off what we do. How much does it cost to build your, your rover? Obviously, sending something to the moon um, is not cheap, uh, but we try to contract uh, to, to, to avoid making it too expensive by first of all making it small and light. Uh, we do that not only because of the cost reduction, but also because of all the applications that we can do from that. I mentioned them already, swarming and all these things. It's so much easier if you have something small and light, but still capable of getting uh, payloads on it. So that's one way of doing it. But then another way is we get we have a lot of partners who build things for us so that we don't have to build it. Uh, and then it, the costs go down also like that. And we try to get also partners for financial side. So it's all interacting between um, the, the um, you know engineering side, making it as cheap as possible on the engineering side, but then also with the people around us, making sure that we have... Uh, enough support from all the different sides to make sure that we can launch uh, to the moon. What kind of programming and robotics do you study and you do? Well, in the TU Delft, there is uh, programming and robotics courses, and many of our, uh, some of our Luna Zebra team members are from those courses, especially in the software side and even the electronic side and structures. Um, and then they really get courses about all there is about electronics. And for robotics, for example, there's even a robotics um, well, a robotics institute, also a robotics team or something um, going on at the TU Delft. So there's plenty of things like that to do. But on the personal side, for me, I'm, I'm more from the aerospace uh, field. So in the aerospace uh, faculty, we do also learn about programming a lot, um, calculating stuff, simulating stuff. Uh, but the robotics side, you can follow a master of robotics, I think, if you want, space robotics. However, uh, that's not what I'm doing personally. Uh, but I do know many people in the in, in Luna Zebra do it, and and they can apply what they learn onto what we do, for example. But for the others, it's about learning what you just missed from not doing that. So it doesn't matter if you're studying it or not; you can still uh, be part of it in some way. What about the analog missions you did um, on Zebra on Earth? That's a very good question, and I think you'll hear Flores talking, our head of electronics, talking about that also a bit. Uh, but uh, it's. So we have Lunar Zebra, which is, we, we are really the team designing the, the moon mission, the moon rover. We can build it and we can test it a little bit, but then if we want to develop our technology even further, it's quite difficult to test it, for example, on the moon straight away. So if you want to test a new thing, we will not launch a whole new rover to the moon just to test that little thing. So we want to test first many different things here on Earth. And to do that, we are trying to um, do, as you said, analog missions or terrestrial missions. Uh, where we go to places, like for example in Iceland, we went to a lava tube, uh, which is an exciting place where there were, were analog astronauts uh, trading as if they are on, let's say, the moon or on Mars. And then we test different things like, um, you know, how would astronauts interact with our rover? Those are things we cannot test ourselves. We also went, for example, in a mine in the UK recently, uh, one kilometer under the ground, and there we 
try to find new use cases for our rover and also test it as if it would be, for example, on a different planet. So we were looking at, uh, can our rover identify if the tube in the, in the mine is stable enough for people to go? Because you don't want someone to wander in a tunnel, which then will collapse. So you want to send first a robot like ours, which can climb easily over obstacles. And then it will sense if there are a lot of uh, earthquakes or something going on. And it will then say, don't come here. But we also have the rover there, for example, who sends um, the, the wind circulation because you want to make sure that there's enough uh, air to breathe and you don't want to go there first and then experience that there's not enough air because that's not nice. So we're trying to do all those different uh, things on the side besides Luna Zebra, but with the goal to test technology and then to, f to, to, to put that in our Luna Zebra missions. Uh, so that's a bit about all the analog missions that we do. And we'll probably do even more. So, so it's exciting to follow us uh, for that. Are you in touch with the ESA, NASA, or other space agencies? We are definitely in touch with companies who are uh, doing things for space agencies. And we try to, to, to keep good relations with different space agencies. So, so we are, as much as possible, making sure that we are visible. For us, it would mainly be ESA. Uh, but the first step for us is not quite ESA, but it's more about the Dutch space uh, sector and then the Dutch um, overarching agency, let's say, of space, who we want to first approach uh, before approaching ESA, which is just above that. So, but we will, we were trying to 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 have good relations with all parties because that's how we then can get partners and can develop ourselves. Yeah, we aim to launch in a, in a couple of years as much as possible. But the main thing is to follow us, and then you'll see it appearing when we actually have a launch date set. What would the rover do first when deployed from the lander? That's a very good question because it's 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 very important to think about this. Um, you can imagine the rover is while it's going to the moon, which can take up to a month or something to go to the moon. Uh, the rover has to make sure that the battery voltage remains quite good and that it, it has to send uh, small signals to Earth, for example, um, to make for us to make sure that it's actually still alive. So it will still be operational, let's say, until touchdown. So once it touches down and once it gets deployed from the lander, the very first thing it needs to do is, of, of course, to make sure that the batteries are still powered uh, at, at a high enough level to make sure that the mission can go on. So the first thing it will try to do is, if it's in the shadow of the lander, then it will try to walk outside of the shadow of the lander and immediately uh, pull up the solar panels and start to recharge the batteries. And then once that happens, then the first, then the mission can actually go on. And so the, the, the goal of the first mission is to show that the C-shaped legs and the locomotion work. But then to do that, we want to walk at least 200 meters away from the lander and also take a few pictures with the cameras we have on board um, to make sure that everything works and perhaps to also get some idea of how the, how the environment looks like. And at the same time, we'll be doing science like the radiation sensor because it's super important for future astronauts to know how much radiation there is because that's causing cancer afterwards. Uh, so all of these things we're trying to do in the first mission. But the very first step is to make sure that we landed safely, also mention it to Earth, saying that we are nicely on the ground, and then making sure that we can recharge uh, the, the batteries. How will the Zebra send the data back to Earth? You have multiple options, obviously, when you're on the moon uh, to send data back to Earth. The most straightforward option is obviously to send it straight to Earth. Uh, but you also have the option, for example, to send it to the lander, and then the lander sends it to Earth, or even to a satellite which orbits the moon, and then the satellite sends it to Earth. What we will try to do is definitely try to do the most straightforward option to send data straight through to Earth. But if that fails, then we'll also um, attempt all the other solutions, which is to communicate through the lander, for example. Um, but the main thing is we want to have direct communication with Earth. Something maybe interesting to, to notice is that we don't just have our normal communication line, but we also have something we call the beacon. So a beacon, like a beacon you see on the seas or, or, or somewhere else, uh, it just transmits basic data saying, I'm alive, uh, I'm here, I'm on the moon, everything is fine, um, all of these things. And we will have this beacon sending data when it just touches down and then throughout the mission, if something happens, the beacon will still be signaling that the rover is powered on and all these things. So we have on one side the beacon and on the other side, just a normal communication to Earth which we try to do in the best way possible. What will the Lunar Zebra explore on the moon and how far will it go? We're a technology demonstration mission on the moon. So um, we have mainly three things that we're kind of focusing on, on the, uh, during the mission. Please walk 250 meters uh, away from the lunar, the lander. So whatever lander that we're on, we want to walk 250 meters away from that. 
um, to demonstrate the locomotion of our uh, very special C-shaped legs. Um, secondly, we have uh, onboard cameras called Shrimp that are designed by actually students from Tierdelft. Um, and we want to try to get pictures off the lunar surface and send them back to Earth. Um, and I think that would be like really nice for us to see. That's also one of the goals. Um, and thirdly, we also want to get radiation readings. Um, so we actually have payload on the rover that's um, that's radiation sensor, and we want to be able to gather radiation readings uh, in our during uh, around our landing site. Um, and that's kind of special because um, we plan to land on the south pole of the moon, and there's not really any radiation samples or anything taken on that. Uh, area of the, of the moon. So um, it will really contribute towards the science that we're going to investigate with the rover. And that's our main science mission. So yeah, it's a revol it revolves around those three concepts. Yeah, maybe uh, Eto, do you, do you have any other questions about the science goals? Uh, yeah, so here, yeah, what are your scientific goals? Yeah, like I said, probably the main one is to get the radiation readings from the South Pole of the moon. Um, yeah, like I said, it's not really been done before and uh, we've not really explored and get, uh, gotten like uh, in situ measurements of radiation on the South Pole. Uh, and like relaying this back to Theodelft, we can actually kind of investigate how these radiation uh, levels in the South Pole of the Moon can actually translate uh, into future manned missions on the Moon. Um, and how uh, these radiation effects will actually uh, play a role in uh, how people survive and live on the Moon. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's really one of the science missions that we're focusing on. Yeah, and, and, and it's a very important one because not a lot of data has yet been captured on the effects of radiation, or at least on the moon, what the radiation level is. And it's super important because we want to go back to the moon, the first women and the next man. So, so we need to know all these informations, and especially from the South Pole side, because that's where we want to send a lot of missions now. So um, it's exciting. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a very cool science goal for now. But there might be future science goals with future missions, for example. So we really build our rover to be uh, modular. Um, such that we can have other payloads as well integrated in the future. Um, and those will contribute to different science goals uh, as opposed to now. But at the moment, the rover is being designed to house a, a radiation sensor. What are your technological goals? We're really trying to be uh, as small as possible. So we want to prove um, the feasibility of the miniaturization of uh, electronics, um, spe uh, specifically COTS electronics, so commercial off-the-shelf uh, components, into uh, a space-grade rover such that we can show that it is possible to miniaturize certain parts of these electronics and that rovers don't need to be as big as uh, as you see they are uh, at the moment. Uh, show the feasibility of the cameras that we developed. So these uh, cameras are called Shrimp and they're developed in-house by students of Theodelft. Um, they weigh close to, uh, if I'm not wrong, three, three grams and we can take uh, 1080p pictures with these. And we really want to be able to send back pictures that we take on the lunar surface. And we can say that, yeah, we developed an in-house sensor and we've gotten pictures back from the moon. Yeah. We also want to show uh, the, the communications, the, the communication power that we can have. So our current mission architecture for communications revolves around us uh, directly communicating to the Earth uh, from our rover. So there's no intermediate relay that goes back. And so we want to prove that this is also possible with our, with our rover on the moon. We are quite proud of it. It's so small, so light. It doesn't, does it do? Uh, one um, 1080p. I thought it was yeah. just about okay. But yeah, so so it, it's very amazing. It's it's the size of a 10 euro cent uh, coin, so it's yeah. super tiny. Uh, that's one of the goals we have to have all of all of it miniaturized as much as possible because the, even a little bit of a gram carry it to the moon and that's super expensive. So you want everything yeah. to be tiny and to be. Like we can't forget we have very unique unique C shaped legs, um, and this allows us to be very maneuverable on the surface and try to uh, cross a lot of terrain. So we also want to prove that these legs are feasible on a, uh, on a rover and that, you know, it does uh, live up to the expectations and uh, a certain uh, advantages that, that it poses. So it will really be new technology on the moon and uh, we hope to prove that it is more effective than wheels. How much do you build uh, yourself your rover? Like, of course, uh, there are, our team is uh, of, comprised of students. Um, so we also have to keep uh, uh, certain things in mind, uh, like to how far we can go designing certain components with given our experience. Uh, we're also kind of lucky in the team to have a lot of professors and experts back us up with a lot of our decisions uh, and uh, how we go about stuff. There, there's a lot of uh, parts that our, student, our students make. So, for example, the payload sensor is actually um, uh, designed by a master student and uh, it's completely done by him. Again, our chassis is completely the, um, designed by our students again to house components the most, uh, in the most suitable way. Uh, of course, there are, like the chassis, we don't manufacture ourselves because there's really small tolerances that we can uh, manufacture at the university. So we do outsource the manufacturing um, in that sense. Parts like our battery management system, um, again, we uh, we outsource this to a di we different companies. So we're actually using uh, 
uh, a battery management system from an external company. Um, and uh, we try and, uh, yeah, so given our experience, we're not, uh, we can't really build this. So we're trying to use uh, that from outside. Our legs are completely also designed by students. So uh, we, we made those legs ourselves and a lot of the optimization of the legs is also carried out by, um, by students. Uh, and in general, whatever we can do uh, with our, uh, by ourselves uh, to, make the, to make the best uh, part, we try and do. But again, there are certain like uh, space grade elements of our rovers, such as um, the, the power system uh, and also some of the multi-layer insulation that we do outsource to other companies. Uh, given their experience, and probably something very interesting as well as uh, space soldering. So yeah. uh, the electronics need to be soldered in a very specific way for space components. Um, while we are trying to get our students to uh, get certified with this and try and do the soldering themselves, at the moment we do rely on uh, other people in the uh, within the university with more experience to help us with this. So we're just slowly trying to get there, slowly trying to make a more of our rover design by students uh, in new innovative ways. How did you design the Zebra? The Zebra is very unique in the in the way it's uh, designed. It does not really look like a conventional um, uh, rover, um, given the ones we've seen on Mars, such as uh, Curiosity. So um, the basis of the project actually came out of uh, the RHEX project by the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this project was the first one to utilize uh, C-shaped legs. So they're really unique locomotive devices we have on uh, Luna Zebra. Uh, however, the, that project was actually aimed on uh, Earth terrain. So it, it, did, it did show the feasibility of these very unique C-shaped legs in crossing a variety of terrain um, through water, through high rocks and everything. So mm -hmm. actually, derivative, uh, sorry, Luna Zebra took a derivative of this design and um, tried to apply it in, the, in a moon setting. Um, so that's where it began. And then on top of this, we added our science goals um, to, you know, uh, to show how uh, we can get radiation readings off the surface of the moon. Uh, and on top of that, we also developed the, the cameras, shrimp, so that we can actually take pictures on here. So that's how Zebra was kind of put together from the initial concept of uh, the C-shaped -shape, legs, uh, now all the way down to our science goals. Um, so that's a very rough timeline of how we designed it. Um, and again, as, as we gain more experience through testing, uh, things like that, this is how we get more details on how we can further optimize our design. Um, so yeah, it's a very iterative process of us trying to converge to a, a, a really nice and optimal design. Yeah, specifically, how did we design the Zero? It, it's a lot of taking into account all the constraints you get when you, when you launch something to space, to the moon, because you have a lot of... Uh, I mean, on one side, you have vacuum, which you have to take into account. You have um, radiation, which you have to take into account. So you have to make sure that your electronics are well, are quite well shielded against those radiations because that can cause big issues. Um, what else do you have? You have all the dust at the, on the moon. It's 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 a very it's a bit of a layer of dust basically on the surface of the moon, which is quite annoying to design for because um, it's for one, it's electrostatically charged, which means that it will. It's a bit like rubbing a balloon against your 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 hair, for example. Then it starts to stick against your your head. It's a bit the same thing that your that these that these dust particles stick to our zebra. And then you can imagine, in every hinge, in everything, if if the dust gets into there, uh, it's getting it's annoying. It's annoying because it's also very abrasive. So 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 it destroys your rover inside of it. So it's a lot of constraints that we have to look into when we design when we go from the zebra that went from the University of Pennsylvania and then to 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 Delft to so the terrestrial zebra when we go from that to our moon zebra we had to rethink quite quite a bit on those practical sides it's a very good point Marnix brought up is uh, the mass that we have so just to put into perspective uh, a very uh, a rough estimate of how much um, it would cost per gram um, so we we've seen that roughly every gram that we add it, uh, adds up to like a thousand euros uh, to to the cost of launch so um, you can imagine every gram counts in uh, to us uh, for us to optimize the design. So uh, two uh, two extra grams would cost us two thousand more euros. So and we really don't want to be spending that. And that and that's why we're so proud about those shrimp cameras, for example, that we have because they're so lightweight. We managed to save quite a bit of weight compared to exactly. different cameras. And we try to do that all over. Also, our C-shaped legs. If you if you want to know details, the the, the fact that we use a C-shaped leg is for one because it can climb over obstacles so much easier than wheels. But secondly, it's much, much lighter than a wheel because we basically have half a wheel or, or, or a third of a wheel, depending on how you look at it. Whereas a full wheel needs, you know, spokes and you need a circle thingy. We have something much simpler. 
again, saving weight. Uh, that's what Jason said. You use a modular design for the lunar receive group? So we've designed the, the payload area and our approach to a payload on the rover, we've tried to make that uh, modular in the sense that we can replace that space with uh, another form of payload that we want. So that's one uh, area that we've uh, looked at to make it uh, modular in that sense. However, it does become uh, increasingly difficult with a, uh, with a space system to make it uh, really uh, modular, That, um, at least in our experience, that was, that's what we've seen, because uh, making stuff modular means that there's not, uh, there's not many uh, solid connections in the sense that we can have. So uh, we're still experimenting this. Um, there have been proposals with, uh, with our electronics team and some of the structures to maybe go towards a modular design so that we can replace and uh, do a lot more. Um, but at the moment, it's not, this, it's not the center of our focus. As I said, we've made the payload area and the payload part of it as modular as we can so that we can swap out stuff. But for the rest of the rover, um, for stuff such as the electronics and chassis, we're, we're still uh, experimenting in how we can kind of uh, go towards some kind of modular design. What material do you use to resist extreme temperature changes on the moon? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because, um, as you can imagine, the, the moon really does not have uh, an atmosphere. So uh, the temperature fluctuations between day and night are like really extreme. So uh, what material do we use? Um, the main chassis of the Zebra is actually just uh, aluminium. Uh, but to insulate the Zebra, we actually use uh, MLI, so uh, multi-layer insulation, as you see in other uh, space missions and satellites. This really provides us with some uh, thermal uh, insulation uh, to endure the, mac the, the large temperature changes we see. Um, apart from that, other interesting materials that we use um, are stuff such as uh, CMC. So, uh, and we use this on our solar panel. Um, sorry, I completely forgot the name of, uh, of that. So we use that on our solar panel so that it can endure the extreme temperatures that the solar panel faces. Because as, as you can imagine, the solar panel is directly in, in, in sunlight. Uh, yeah, so it was a ceramic matrix composite, to be exact, CMC, and this is what we use on the solar panel. Uh, and as I mentioned, MLI on the on this basically the chassis of the rover, so that we maintain thermal insulation there. Yeah, uh, and we also use a high performance material, a three D printed material called Altem, um, and this is also able to endure uh, maximum temp like fatigue, like temperature changes, such that the the material does not fatigue expanding and contracting, uh, causing uh, more issues there. Uh, to answer your question of how long the rover will survive on the moon, our mission is planned for 14 days on Earth. That correlates to one lunar uh, day. Um, so one lunar day is our mission at the moment. That co that corresponds to 14 Earth days. Um, and we've, we're only designing it to survive that one lunar day. But uh, we'll see when we start up after that if we uh, if we actually survive the lunar night because it gets very cold very fast. Yeah, but speaking of this, this 14 days uh, being one moon day, that's maybe something people don't quite um, think about because we always talk about the, the dark side of the moon and the bright side and etc. So the moon is not very well understood by people, I have the impression. Uh, so you always see only one side of the moon and that's because the moon rot uh, rotates around its own axis, but it happens to do that in basically one, one month, which is the time it takes to orbit the Earth. And if it rotates around its own axis in one month, then you can only see one side of the moon. But the fact that it rotates around its axis means that actually all sides of the moon eventually get sunlight and get dark. Uh, but since it does that in one month, uh, which is more or less 30 days, let's say, then, then half of that would be the daytime, and that's 14 days. So we designed for that, because at the moment, we don't have all the full installations needed to survive the moon. Because the moon, you can imagine, I think temperatures drop around minus... Uh, at least 180, maybe minus 200 during night times. So it's extremely, extremely cold. During day times, we, to, to give numbers, I think we expect between uh, minus 130 and, and plus, uh, was it 200 uh, degrees or something? Yeah, uh, it's, it's in the ballpark. Yeah. 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 So it's quite super extreme temperatures. Maybe something to, to add to what Jason said about um, the, the, the high performance 3D printing material we use for some small parts. Uh, he mentioned that. Um, it has to resist fatigue of, of the fact that it contracts and it expands because of thermal uh, reasons. Um, yeah, every time you, 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 you heat something up, it obviously it expands and then it contracts. But for our chassis, it's the same thing. The chassis will also expand and contract. So what we've done to avoid 
you know, if you, if you imagine that we build the chassis in multiple plates, multiple sheets of aluminium, for example, then each of these sheets can expand and contract in different ways. So it's quite difficult to assemble all of these different sheets to, to form one nice chassis. So what we do, and that's also something a few other aerospace companies do, is, is we cut, it, cut our chassis out of uh, one entire block of aluminium. And then we're sure that it expands and it contracts exactly as predicted in one uniform way. So, so that's also something uh, a bit fancy we try to do to avoid all those issues with the thermal, thermal uh, problems on the uh, on, on the moon. Yeah. Do you have different sizes of the zebra? Yeah. So this was a part of our experimental. At the moment, two types of zebra that we could, that we're like really focusing on. Um, that's the the lunar zebra. So we have uh, the actual moon uh, rover, and secondly the terrestrial zebra. Um, but as you can, uh, but as you can see, we've also experimented with uh, smaller and larger versions of um, the zebra concepts. So uh, Pico Zebra, probably the smallest uh, and uh, the smallest zebra that we have. It's actually just kind of built around um, like PCBs, uh, as you can see. And this was just uh, to see how how miniaturized we could actually make the, that the zebra concept. And, and just just to give an idea of how small it actually is, because on the images it's not always clear unless you see, for example, a hand or. Or a banana, I don't know, next to it for scale. Uh, to to know how small it is, it it's basically the size of a matchbox. Yeah, exactly. so it's super mm -hmm. tiny and with tiny tiny legs. And you can imagine these because we're always trying to find applications for all these different sizes. You can and we might come to swarming at some point. You can imagine um, a swarm, so so many of these different small small rovers swarming, for example, in in the luggage holes of, uh, of of an airport or something and each of them has a little nose a little sensor which can sense uh particles in the air and then you can search for for example illegal stuff such as dr drugs and all these things and because they're so tiny they can they can walk everywhere really so that's that's one of the applications for those tiny ones so then yeah jason sorry i'm interrupting you we, we also have other no no it's completely right. i think i think you got a good so, uh, I mean, these different versions that we see are just for us to experiment on the scalability of the zebra concept. So, as, uh, as Monique said, we can make it as small as a matchbox, but also uh, make a rover that weighs like 20 kilograms. That's the kilo zebra. Um, but at the moment, the two main ones, and, and then the lunar zebra, which is really focused on the, the moon environment. How much does the Pico zebra weigh? Um, the, the Pico Zebra, I'm uh, I'm not too I'm not 100 percent sure on on the mass of it, but it, it's it's in the ballpark of I think 250 to 500 grams if I'm not wrong. Um, yeah, that's a good price. Yeah. Yeah. And not five, not even 500 grams. It's it's more in the range of 200 grams or something. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't weighed it actually yet. But it's super tiny. That's the main thing you have to. Yeah. How do you uh, handle the moon dust? Uh, as Monique said before, moon dust is actually very uh, abrasive to, to the zebra. Um, that means as we as we uh, walk on the moon, we're actually really damaging our legs uh, with this, the constant abrasion of uh, the moon dust. Uh, if you, the moon dust is actually very fine as well, so it really just sticks onto everything and it is statically charged. Um, so this really make, becomes a big uh, issue when you look at our um, connections uh, with our legs and, and motors because we don't want any dust getting into the, the motor bushes such that we uh, um, we start jamming those things. So to handle this, uh, actually, we um, we have a lot of ceilings around the, the rover. Um, this also, these range from uh, complete uh, complete mechanical ceilings with like O-rings um, and sometimes also some uh, active ceilings that have to go around the, um, the motor bushes, for example, because they still have to rotate. Um, and these uh, will help us prevent moon dust from actually getting inside the rover and its uh, electronics. And uh, to answer your question also, why not use wheels? Uh, as we explained before, uh, using these C-shaped legs actually allows us to cross over uh, terrain that's close to um, 1.5 times our size. So we can go over these rocks and this would not be possible with conventional wheels. Uh, and additionally, uh, as Marek pointed out before as well, a C-shaped leg actually comprises of uh, half or a third of a wheel, depending on how you look at it. So we really save some weight in that uh, uh, in that respect. So I can also see that you asked, can we operate upside down? Um, this has been proven with our terrestrial zebra. So we can actually, uh, we like uh, in previous uh, versions, we can actually walk upside down. But um, with the lunar zebra, we have all of our solar panels and uh, sensors on top there. So it wouldn't really be smart for us to do that. Um, but in theory, it, it can work, and we can operate upside down because essentially all all the legs have to do is just rotate uh, around 180 degrees. 
maybe a fun example of uh, of this, the fact that we can operate upside down for at least our terrestrial rovers. Indeed, for our moon rover, it might be difficult because of the solar panel. So, so a nice example of this is we went recently on a, you can call it an analog mission, if you wish, uh, inside of um, a mine in, in the United Kingdom, uh, one kilometer down. Uh, and there we were testing the rovers to, to its limit, basically trying to climb a bit of a steep uh, incline, and it flipped upside down by, by, by accident. And our operator did still manage to drive the rover, even if it was upside down, um, just because of the wheels being able still to touch the ground. So, so it's theoretically possible, but we will have to see if it happens on the moon, how we can resolve the issue. But for yeah, terrestrial rovers, it's no problem. Do you have a way of flipping it? Like if the lunar rover is flipped, We've uh, looked at this in, with the terrestrial rovers, uh, and we can produce enough impulse to kind of uh, bounce us up in the other direction and uh, flip us over. Uh, however, with the Lunar Zebra, the way the motors are designed, uh, the legs are um, like the speed at, at which the legs turn are actually much slower, so we can't really generate that impulse. Uh, however, however, we try and combat this by getting our center of gravity really far down uh, the rover such that we uh, we try and negate the possibility of us actually flipping upside down uh, during operations. And we really try and be careful um, uh, with uh, what we cross. With yeah. our semi-autonomous navigation, we try and not go uh, too far over our limits, actually. But by, by impulse, I think what you mean, Jason, is, is like when you're sitting in one of those chairs, which can, you know, those desk chairs, which can rotate when you, when I suppose it's when you move your arms, for example, very fast, and then you see that your whole body rotates as well. So, yeah. so we, we saw that on our terrestrial rovers, we can move our arms or the, the legs fast enough to make it flip somewhat, especially lunar gravity. But on, on our lunar, uh, lunar rover for now, it's not quite possible. But yeah, we tried, we will, if it happens, then we will probably try as much as possible to get it back up. But uh, yeah, this, the center of gravity does help. Uh, yeah. You develop your own custom PCB? Yes, we actually do so. Um, so both for the moon rover and for the terrestrial rover. Um, so for the terrestrial rover, we could say that in general, the whole development time is a bit shorter because we can like quicker develop things and also implement things and test it. So the whole development cycle is really quite short on the terrestrial rover. And um, we make everything ourselves, um, except the main computer on board, which is a Raspberry Pi for the uh, terrestrial rover. So everything is made by ourselves, except for the Raspberry Pi. And for the Moon Rover itself, uh, we work together with a couple of companies who make some parts for us. Um, but for instance, the communications, uh, the payload, uh, the motherboard, we all do ourselves. And the parts we get from um, external companies, our partners, are for instance, uh, the motor drivers. But the motor drivers are also developed by a student, uh, uh, by a Lunar Zero student. And that Lunar Zero student did his thesis together with a company. So that's why the company is now providing us that part. And also the main computer of the Moon Rover is also developed by an external party. But for the rest, we do uh, everything ourselves. And the second question, uh, what sensor do you have and how do you know that they are correct and can be trusted? Do you have more than a camera? Um, yes, I think we can also answer that in like two parts. So um, for the Moon Rover, we have the two shrimp cameras. I think you already discussed it in the first part. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, so yes, we have those two, and we also have an IMU on board, and um, other sensors you could think of like temperature sensors, and for instance, a, pen, a sensor on the solar panel uh, to check if we can get like the maximum power from the sun. Um, and for the terrestrial rover, we also have like two cameras. So actually, it's one camera, a stereo camera. And uh, the terrestrial ro rover is built in such a way that it is a platform. Uh, for all kind of other sensors. So basically, like any other sensor you want, you can just plug it in because there are like plenty of uh, communication buses free. Um, so right now we have uh, uh, IMU, uh, ultrasonic sensors, uh, LiDAR, uh, camera, but in principle, you can put on it uh, anything you want. What software did you use and did you develop it? So for the uh, Moon Rover, software which was developed is also developed in-house. So both for the firmware and the motor drivers, the um, software which is running uh, now on the onboard computer, etc., by the software team of Luna Zebra. And how did you develop it? Um, could you elaborate on that question? Did you make the code and uh, how did you write the code? 
Ah, okay, yeah. So I'm not part of the software team, I'm part of the electronics team. But uh, the software team, they are indeed uh, writing the code together. I think there's now a team of uh, six software uh, people. And um, they have like quite a structured way of doing it. <laughs> That's always really um, cool to see with software engineers. Um, uh, there are like two persons now working on the main computer to code it. Then there's like one person who is really focusing on the communications module and another person uh, more on the shim and uh, motor drives interface. Um, so they developed it um, quite separately, I would say. And then integration, they... Um, so I think you mean in this case, a locomotion system, right? Uh, if it can switch in different locomotion modes for walking, or a really good point because uh, we really have the opportunity and also the uh, option to really um, choose different locomotion algorithms on different kind of crowds. So um, if we, for instance, notice that we are on a really steep angle, we could use another, a different locomotion algorithm than if we know that we are on like an extremely flat surface. Or if we, for instance, have to walk like with like 30 degrees inclination angle, which is along the width of the rover, then you can also use a different one. Or if, it, if you're walking on a surface, which is like really muddy, or not really muddy, but like not sturdy, let's say, then you, of course, also want a different algorithm than when you're walking on stones, let's say. Um, so yes, um, we have different algorithms. And at this moment, we're still implementing um, that the rover can um, switch between those algorithms autonomously. So it's, it's able to detect in that case on which ground it is currently walking, and then it would be able to adapt uh, according to the different undergrounds. But that's still being developed uh, right now. But that's, that's indeed something important for on the moon because we don't know exactly the surface that we will have on the moon. Yeah. So it would be uh, quite useful to have multiple ways of walking depending on what kind of surface uh, we have. How does the swarming work? As uh, Flo said before, our, um, our terrestrial uh, zebra projects actually um, are used uh, in, in, a, in a way as uh, test beds for technologies that we can further implement into the lunar zebra. So um, at the moment, we're investigating the swarming capabilities of the terrestrial zebras, and then we hope to actually implement these uh, algorithms in, in, the, in the lunar missions. So actually, the swarming, the, in the way we're doing in the terrestrial zebras is that um, our aim is actually just to uh, spread them out in a field, uh, and uh, as, soon as, as soon as one of these rovers uh, randomly walk and detect um, one, um, what do you say, target, um, this will kind of be communicated to other rovers, and then we kind of form a, a potential map of that area such that we can kind of navigate and find the target. Um, so that's actually what we're kind of focusing on uh, at the moment. By, by potential map, Jason, because it's 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 terms we tend to use, but I don't oh, yes. know if that's very common. By potential map, uh, Eto and, and for the viewers, uh, it's imagine you have a swarm of, of zebras all walking in a cave and they're looking for water, for example. And so they're all walking a bit in a random way, in different ways, but then all of a sudden one of them sees water and it will start to shout, I see water, there's water in front of me. And the, the rover behind it will listen to that signal and then it will be able to say, uh, someone in front, uh, the rover in front of me has found water. And then it will start shouting that the rover in front of me has found water. Then the rover behind this rover will say, the rover in front of me has found the rover in front of him who has found water, etc., etc. And then you have a chain of rovers saying, go to the next rover to get closer and closer to the uh, water or to whatever you're looking for. It could also be people if it's in a collapsed building. And that's what we call a bit of a potential field because then you can trace back uh, through the swarm where the thing is that you're looking for. So that's the key strength of a swarm, I would say. But sorry, Jason, I continue. Right. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, good. That's, a, that's a good way to explain it. Um, so yeah, as you can imagine, like uh, swarming is actually quite a, quite a big uh, obstacle that we're trying to really work on at the moment because it involves uh, sort of a distributed network, if you want to put it uh, in that way. So everything has to, information has to travel uh, to multiple rovers at the same time and communicate. So that's really something that we have a, a good amount of people and a good software team trying to uh, trying to focus on right now. Um, with the payload, I think I mentioned before that we have a radiation sensor on on the on the on the lunar rover, um, and also as you mentioned multiple times, the shrimp cameras. Um, actually, like even more, the, the payload, the radiation sensor is mainly for us to gather radiation readings from the south pole of the moon, um, such that we can actually use these radiation readings to assess uh, further lunar missions and manned lunar missions on the moon. For for Lufar. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, this this is a really big plan that we've had. At the moment, we're trying to still uh, get our uh, our lunar rover ready for the moon mission. 
And once we've proved the feasibility of that, then we uh, then we're going to then we're going to potentially try further to investigate this. Uh, maybe Marnix, you have something to add to that as well. Yes, I also want to add a little bit about the payload first, because what we really want to do with our zebras, you don't just look at them now as, as one unique mission with a very strange C-shaped like concept. But what we really want to do is to have a bit of a platform uh, that we can send to the moon. So, so the, the platform on which we can put whichever payloads which people would want us to put on there. Now it happens to be um, radiation, because that's something people want to do research onto. But in the future, it might be whatever you want. And one of the ideas, the very far-fetched ideas that we have is something we call LUFAR. It's an acronym. But it's basically where we would send um, a swarm of rovers to the backside of the moon. Because as I mentioned, the moon, you only see one side of the moon, one very recognizable side of the moon. But the backside, you never see it. And we want to send a swarm of rovers there. And now the question is, why do we want to send the swarm? To explain this, I need to back up a little bit because on Earth, uh, so uh, actually I need to back up quite a bit because in the Let's back up to all the way to the Big Bang. Um, at the Big Bang, many things happened, but we're not quite sure what exactly happened at the Big Bang. And the only way to view this now uh, is to look in the radio wave uh, spectrum, because there we can still see the very early, early universe uh, appearing as it was roughly around the Big Bang and a little bit uh, later. So that's what we call the, the early universe. We want scientists want to observe that to know a bit more about our history, etc., and all those things. But the issue is, it's very, it's quite difficult to look at it on the Earth because you can imagine on the Earth we have Wi-Fi, we have radio, we have communications with satellite, so it's very noisy in terms of radio frequencies. So what we want to do is actually go to somewhere where it's very quiet, so somewhere far away from the Earth. And the best place to do this, still close by to Earth, is actually on the backside of the moon. The whole moon actually blocks you from all the Wi-Fi signals, all the satellite signals, all the radio waves. It's all blocked by the moon. So that means that you're in a super, super quiet place. And scientists know this already for, 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 for years and years. So what they have in their mind is to send a giant, to build over there a giant uh, radio telescope and then to observe the thing over um, with such a big device. But obviously that's super expensive. So we want to send a swarm over there with each of them little tiny antennas. And then you can combine the data from all these little tiny antennas if you've arranged them in a certain way to simulate one giant dish, basically. So it's a super exciting concept, which we're hoping maybe in the future to do. And now there are people researching on this. So yeah, that, that's one of the applications we have for, for, the, for, the, for Luna Zero. But then the, the other ones maybe closer by is just swarming. And then that's going into caves, for example, in, in, uh, in the moon because there are caves uh, which big rovers would never go to because it's very dangerous. As soon as you hit a rock too hard or you fall upside down, then your whole mission is over. So all the millions and millions of dollars you paid to get the mission launched is gone in, in one instance. But if we have a swarm of it, then let's say you send 20 of them there, just one falls down over this rock, then you still have 19 left. So you can still continue the mission and it's much more safe and more economic to do this. So it's, it's all very exciting ideas that we have with swarming. Uh, it just depends on what people want us to do with it. But the first step is obviously to show that it actually works and sending it to the moon. I hope this, this answers a little bit uh, the, our future ideas. Uh, later. Do you play Kabu space program? Ah, uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> well, I'm afraid in Luna Zero, there's a bit of a divide between people. Some people are very fanatic about Kerbal Space Program, but others have never touched it. We're, we're I'm on the side of the Kerbal Space Program lovers, but then and I think Flores uh, as well has played it a bit, has, haven't you? Yeah, indeed, on high school especially. But I'm afraid uh, is Jason in the camp of the non-players? Yeah, I mean I've heard a lot about the the, the game, uh, but um, I've not really played it myself, unfortunately. But uh, I've been told by uh, I, I've been told by Monix that I really need to try to get into it. So. Uh, I know that Kerbal Space Program 2 is coming out, so I might get into it at, at that time. Yeah. A, a fun challenge for anyone playing it is to try to, because I know there has been an expansion pack or something to do robotic missions. A fun thing to try is to create a Lunar Zebra, for example, in Kerbal Space Program. That would be very fun. And do share it with us then if you do it. <laughs> but yeah, so there are big Kerbal Space Program lovers and then few who haven't touched it yet. They will soon. Well, do you play it a lot, Eto? Yeah, I've played a lot. I, it's like, I don't know, it was like maybe 200 hours. I can't remember how much it is, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Have you built two rovers? I personally, not yet. I was just very happy when I landed on the moon without crashing too much. <laughs> uh, and doing, I was always in the complex missions and, and complex launches and all these things. No, but I've never, have you tried Flores uh, to make rovers? 
No, but like your idea, your suggestion of making like a Luna Zero mission a common space program, I think it will be like a really cool challenge. We said it like 95% of us would fail on doing it. So yeah, it will be maybe a nice team event to try that. If you want, Eto, I can challenge you to try to create a hashtag Kerbal Luna Zero or something. Do you have a big announcement or dream you want to say? At this stage, we don't have big announcements. Uh, I would, I mean, the big announcement is, I suppose, that people should really start following us because we are getting more closer and closer to the to the moon mission. Uh, so we've been building a, a, a first prototype in 2000, a few years back, and now we are finally to the stage where we build again the second prototype. So it's very, very exciting to follow us now as we build it. Afterwards, who knows when we will start announcing the actual launch date and then actually going to the moon. And then for, uh, definitely once we start announcing it, then you have to follow us and, and follow all the steps of our moon mission. Because it's, it's after all the first European moon rover that we are sending. So it's quite, uh, quite exciting. What are your personal future plans? Well, I'll try to take this Luna Zebra experience with me. And, and I'm also an aerospace student. So I might, I'll, I'll definitely, it's already a combination of the two. So I'll try to gather all of that to, to probably find myself a very good very nice, uh, in, especially a challenging position somewhere in the aerospace field, I suppose. Or it may also be somewhere kind of entirely different. But at the moment, my plans aren't quite set in stone. Well, I'm hoping definitely to see this launch happen at some point, whether that's with me and the team or just me following along from the from the side view. That would be, still be nice. At least for me, so I'm uh, I'm actually completing my bachelor's and uh, then then kind of beginning my master's in space engineering. So uh, I, for me, really, I, I just like getting my hands on uh, anything really interesting and challenging. So. Uh, I'm usually only limited by uh, the time uh, and interest I have. So I, so for me, at the, at the moment, uh, it's really just whatever really interests me. I'm going for it, and uh, yeah, we'll see where we'll see where that ends up. And for me, it's kind of the same. I'm starting actually with my master in electrical engineering, and what I've always enjoyed is because I was really doubting in my bachelor's attitudes for aerospace engineering or electrical engineering, but now I think I find like the perfect balance for doing electrical engineering while doing it like in a space kind of field outside of my studies in the, uh, this awesome project. Um, so yeah, I would definitely continue with um, being like involved in this kind of space projects. And I, I think, I don't know yet, of course, but in the future, I see myself working at a space oriented company, but of course in the field of electronics, because like my passion is really in uh, electronics. And what are your plans actually, Otto, <laughs> like in the future? I want to make a rocket company. Cool, cool. Nice. A bit ambitious. No, I think I think it's good. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I, I saw on your YouTube channel you also uh, did you make a, a rocket nozzle or some part from uh, 3D printed PLA like a long time back. Tire rocket out of totally multiple PLA. Yeah, I think that's already quite impressive. Did, did it work with you like the PLA? Because in high school I also tried it, but in my case the nozzle it only withstand would withstand the heat for like 500 milliseconds, while the rocket had to burn for like three seconds. So I was not able to manage to make like a prop, uh, like let's say a proper functioning rocket out of just three D printed PLA. My no. rocket for some reason worked. Well, that's the, that's the annoying bit. If you print it out of PLA, then it will mel melt at some point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah. But at that moment, we were playing around with like certain layers of other materials in the nozzle. Uh, I don't know the English word, but like the stuff you put in like the back where your cat always sleeps. Ah, um, yeah. I don't know the English word, but like we, we use that on our PLA print. That worked quite well, but it's also heavy. So. <laughs> it's nice, and who knows, maybe that will be the next uh, Elon Musk then, then in, the, in Europe. <laughs> Do you have any advice to young space makers or rocketeers? That's indeed something people ask us very often. It's all about, I would say, don't, the, well, the, the obvious sentence is that the, the, um, things are not uh, as ambitious as you as it as they seem at first you really have to uh, if you have a, an objective which you think is too ambitious then just try to to divide it in little steps and and think about how can you tackle the first problem how can you tackle the second one try to get a few people who are like-minded like you and try to build up slowly what you want to do the sky is not a limit and so you really can do whatever you want in the future and for us even as a student building something that goes to the moon is incredibly nice to work on it's 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 a very unique opportunity so really you can do anything it's just a matter of looking into how it can be done and then probably you'll see that it can be done so just go for it i would say 
uh, and follow your dreams. What are your favorite space movies? One of the more realistic, although it had some flaws, was uh, the Gravity movie. Things go wrong around the space station. That one was very nice because you can see from the perspective of, of the astronauts how it looks like and it feels very realistic. But then a classic also is the 2001 Space Odyssey, for example. Any any space movies to recommend? Well, there is uh, like Star Wars and Interstellar. Which are uh -huh. nice. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. And then even on YouTube, you have some nice uh, space content that you can get access to. Scott Manley, for example, is a very famous uh, YouTuber who you might know from the Kerbal Space Program. Yeah. Do, do you follow other YouTubers as well? Yes, the everyday astronaut. Yes. Yeah. And he, he does a lot about SpaceX and, and with Elon Musk. Uh, things that's nice to follow. Yeah. And, and in general, maybe not quite space, but in, in general, engineering. YouTube channels, there is Smarter Every Day, which is a very nice one. Yeah, and then there are also more physics ones like Steve Mould or, or uh, Stand Up Math, which is more mathematic. So you really get everything you would like. But in space, I think Scott Manley is my favorite together with Everyday Astro. Do you have any questions for me? How do you see your, your YouTube channel evolving in the future? Do you want to grow it and continue doing... Um interviews like these or do you plan to to do also other fancy videos so i think i'm going to like finish doing the, the interviews of the space or rocketry teams and uh, i started a team in my local university so maybe i'll do some videos for recruitment yeah that's nice maybe some tutorials on how to build something Ooh, yeah if you if you at some point make a tutorial on how to if you try to make a lunar zebra for example in Kerbal space program then you have to do something else or do you plan to do tutorials on building uh, actual rockets then i could do like a, a lunar zebra on Kerbal. i think i'll also do like the more real life stuff yeah. Like, I don't know, building an alternator or a rocket. There is a very good YouTube channel building uh, rockets. And even, I don't know if you know them, uh, but it, it's one person, one guy, uh, and he's also trying to land his own rocket that he launches. He wants to land them vertically. You PBS might have... Space? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. He's very, very nice. I think he started making videos again recently. That's something you can do, and I'm sure it will get a lot of uh, views then. I'm, I'm very happy that we finally could do this interview because uh, I'm sorry for postponing it uh, a little bit. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the end result. Uh. Thanks for joining me. For anyone uh, watching, please like, comment, subscribe, watch more videos on the YouTube channel, watch the Zero Space Zebra YouTube channel. And especially like and, and uh, subscribe to this channel because it's, it's very amazing content to show off all the student teams and, and it motivates i think young people to join space uh, things as well it was uh, it was great talking to you Eto. wish you all the best uh, for your future and everything so uh, looking forward to uh, hearing more from your youtube channel as well so Th thanks uh, for having us yeah thanks for being here